so we are live now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, again. So we have reached the final session of uh, International Reverse Logistics Online Conference. I'd like, I am, uh, it's an immense pleasure to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Tony, Executive Director of uh, Reverse Logistics Association. He'll be our last presenter today. In 2016, Tony took over the RLA and became the Executive Director and a publisher after 12 years of active involvement on the advisory board and on committees. With 35 plus years in the consumer products industry, he has held many positions, including 15 years in returns management at Philips with uh, new reverse logistics strategies and returns initiatives. He is considered a subject matter expert in reverse logistics and speaks for the industry at conference over the globe. So today he'll be discussing about uh, the e-commerce hangover, returns and uh, reverse logistics. It's a pleasure to have you here, Mr. Tony, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Chelsea. And it is an honor to be invited to this event halfway across the world. The Reverse Logistics Association uh, that I took over in 2016 uh, has participated and presented events all over the world. And uh, this one is my first with the e-commerce team. And uh, I understand from my colleagues in the industry that this is a very, very important organization. So thank you so much for this opportunity. You can see my information on the screen. And I, I, uh, I excuse Chelsea because my last name is a challenge. It is Sharota, Tony Sharota. And as she said, I spent many years at Phillips uh, working on uh, sales and marketing. And then they said, go fix the returns problem. And it was a, a big problem back then. So we uh, we move forward to today where the e-commerce hangover of returns and reverse logistics has become the biggest problem uh, in, in the world, in, in the retail world. And my contact information is there. Uh, I'll say a couple of words here quickly about the Reverse Logistics Association. I won't even say them all. I have provided this presentation to Chelsea and ReCommerce, and you may look up uh, any of this information at any time. But we are the only authoritative body for the best practices in reverse logistics. We are a global trade association with many, many members, and they're all featured on the website. We offer information and research and solutions, and we facilitate network introductions between manufacturers, retailers, and many third-party solutions providers. We, are, we consider ourselves the global voice of the industry. Our goal is to educate as we are today. And again, you can join the community at our website at no cost, and it is rla.org. So why are we here today? Because reverse logistics is becoming uh, an important factor, especially as a part of the circular economy, which it clearly is. You cannot be in a circular economy without reverse logistics. And that begins at the point where a product comes back for any reason. And immediately someone has to disposition the product and then that product enters the circular economy. Will it be repaired? Will it be repackaged and put on the shelf? Will it be put back into inventory and sold? Uh, will it be refurbished, recycled, repaired, uh, and also um, uh, recycled? Is it an important aspect, but not the most important? The most important is to find ways to take these returns and do good things with them. But why are we getting all of these returns? Well, because the e-commerce hangover is all about if you make it people easy for people to shop online, they will. And then their returns will be much, much higher, 25 to 35% of sales versus 8 to 9% in stores. That's been the traditional global numbers that I've learned from Europe, from Asia, and from especially North and South America. And it is a factor of the e-commerce uh, industry that returns are higher. But let's talk about th this ticking time bomb. What What is going on? A lot of people find it difficult to return goods that they purchase online. And they think the process is complicated, 51% of them. 46% um, of the people who are surveyed feel that dropping a parcel off is inconvenient. And 58%, I think that number is low, no one wants to pay for a return ever. Hence the Amazon model and other uh, e-commerce models 
you never pay for a return and it's free shipping. But also the danger is that over 25% of consumers return online goods more than 10% of the time. They're buying multiple gifts, multiple items, multiple purchases, knowing they plan to return them. Now, 25%, 24% would be glad to return it to a post office. 38% would like a delivery company to pick it up. 12% would like to would consider taking it back to a store. And 17% would return it to a convenience store, a 7-Eleven, if you would. So there's multiple ways of returns from e-commerce coming back that, but but you understand by seeing this that no one is happy with one way. They want different ways. Different people want different ways of doing it. And 83% of the consumers will shop more at a retailer online who makes the returns process easier. So let's talk a little bit more about that. The online return space has identified much higher returns, as we said. Electrical is 10%. Housewares, uh, homeware, 10%. Furniture, much higher, 15%. We'll talk about the reasons. Health and beauty, also 15%. Sports and travel equipment, generally 15%. And this report is a little bit older. So we know that fashion, which is reported as 25% returns, is actually much higher. So let's talk about why and how some of that happens. Well, one more about returns cost. The cost is becoming uh, so high that... Uh, the time, the administration of preparing those goods, it erodes the, the margins for the, the retailers and the manufacturers. And that's our focus as an association, those retailers and manufacturers who know, who buy, who sell things and make things and know they're going to get returns. And you have now the consumers willing to admit 19% of them say they order multiples of the same item to make a decision at home. of them over-purchase expecting to return unwanted items. These are people who buy online a lot. And 33% of the retailers now have had to increase their prices to counter these rising returns volume. And then 31% of the retailers also say managing returns processes impacts their profit margins. And now we're talking about money and it's affecting all of the retailers and manufacturers. If you've not been to a repair warehouse, a return warehouse, the pictures on the right and the left are what you would see. And I wanted to make sure the picture on the left was important because I have been to returns facilities that look like that. The one on the right, of course, those are pallets. Even though they're mixed up, they look a lot cleaner, a lot more organized but they come in as they do on that picture on the left. And what people don't realize is every one of those products in there represents a customer who had a bad experience, a consumer who something went wrong when they bought that product. So what could go wrong? Well, let's talk about the size of the market one more time because consumers are returning globally an estimated 10% of retail sales. E-commerce, depending on which part of the world you're in, was somewhere between 15 to 20% of retail sales in 2020, of course, because of the pandemic. Uh, Prior to that, e-commerce was a small percentage of the business, maybe 10% and 90% was still being done in the stores. But now it's almost an 80-20 split. But merchandise that was purchased online that's returned more than doubled the return rate from 2020 uh, over 2019. Over 25% of purchases online, as we said, are being returned. And it's important to recognize that as e-commerce grows and it has a higher returns rate, the amount of returns is just going to continue. And unfortunately, all of the retailers and the e-commerce online retailers They now have enabled a returns mentality and it has become a competitive sledgehammer. If you don't do it for your customer who buys from you online, they are one click away from buying it from someone else who will do it. 
Now, there is an omni-channel aspect to this. And just to explain, the omni-channel is viewed on, on the screen there. The omni-channel means you can buy it online and return it to a store. Now, some global major retailers like Carrefour and Walmart and the Home Depot and Amazon, well, not Amazon, but others that have brick and mortar stores, they like to sell you something online and have you come in the store to bring it back as a return. It saves them money, but the odds are you will buy something else. So that is the omni-channel complexity about buying online, returning in the store. You can also, complexity is you can buy online and you can pick it up in the store. Many, many retailers have moved forward and gotten smart to allow a customer to use every single store as a warehouse, as a pickup point. So if you buy from a Carrefour store or a Walmart store, you can pick it up at the store or the store individually can ship it to you or can drop it off. So there's a lot of complexity on the forward and the reverse side because of all of these multiple opportunities. Again, we need to recognize that returns represent on average nine to 12% of total sales for any company, but that expenses can represent seven to 11% cost of the goods sold. And that's where I made the difference at Phillips because we worked with retailers to drop that 12% number down to 4% by a lot of different activities, best practices that we learned and that we preach about today at the Reverse Logistics Association. So let's be specific to one industry category. The apparel industry has learned what the nightmare is for e-commerce sales of clothing. Most people are buying extra sizes and extra colors. Why? Because I've had the experience myself of being in Singapore and I happened to wear an extra large shirt. But in Singapore, I had to get a 4XL to be the same size as a standard XL. And that's the problem. So much of the time, people are buying things and they will buy in shoes a, a size 12 and a size 13 and a size 14 because they're not sure what will fit. So automatically, if they are buying one size larger, one size smaller, and one fits, you have two thirds being returned. That's a 66% return rate. It's dramatic. Also, we have learned through research that if you use a model to represent your clothing online, as you can see in the pictures here, you are likely to get a higher returns because again, people are buying what they think you are selling. You set the expectations in what you show on the screen. And if you show the products, the clothing, the, the shoes, fitting somebody and looking great, when they get that product and they open the box and they put it on at home, they expect to look like one of these models. And if they don't, they are more likely to return it. And a lot of this is again, because the world has become two-dimensional. When we're talking like this, we are two-dimensional. You can see me, you can hear me, but you can't shake my hand. You don't know how tall I am, what size I am, uh, if, if I even have shoes on, right? But it's a two-dimensional depiction of three-dimensional products and experiences that are two-dimensional like we're doing right now are not the same as a three-dimensional experience, but you approach it with a three-dimensional background. So when the packages arrive at your door, if it does not meet the expectations that you perceive when you looked at this and ordered it, you are going to return things because of those unmet expectations. And by the way, that's not just clothing. When I was at Phillips for 25 years and the first 10 years in sales and marketing, I didn't think twice about what we said on the packages, what we said on the signs, what we said in the ads. That was marketing. That was advertising. But the consumer who buys it 
reads the box, reads the packaging, reads the ads, and they take it home thinking it will do something. And if it doesn't do that, they're going to bring it back. So marketing plays into this very, very much. And again, the holy grail in the electronics industry, whether it's Dell or HP or Acer or Philips or Samsung or LG, all these brands, they know the experience of getting returns that generally are not defective. They don't have a technical fault. And that was the holy grail of what's going on. Why are people returning so many things that the engineers say these goods are perfect? And the same happens in clothing. People were returning things because of the size variations. And also, with the supply chain nightmares that are going on right now, with winter approaching, for example, in North America, people order boots for the winter, they'll order winter coats, and if those products don't arrive until maybe middle of January or the end of January, they're going to say, oh, there's no more snow coming or it's not going to be as cold anymore. I'm going to send it back. Now, those are seasonal returns. So you can understand that the apparel industry is in disarray right now because of these high returns. And by the way, if a, a seasonal jacket sells for, let's say, 100 US dollars, if you get it back and you have to resell it in the secondary market, you are fortunate if you can get pennies on the dollar. And what happens when those goods are returned? Can they always be returned to the shelf? That's a challenge because you have to look for those products. Look at the shoes and see if they've been worn. Look at the jackets and see if they have uh, a tear in them somewhere. Look at the, the shirts and the pants and the dresses. Are they stained? Are Did, did somebody smoke uh, a lot with them? And you can't resell that as new. So there's a, a, a challenge and a cost that's, that's going very, very high in the apparel space. That's the bad news. Good news, there are some solutions. Um, the solutions include upcycling. So some garments that come back, if they've been torn, if they've been stained, they can be broken down to the fibers, to the cotton, to the wool, uh, to the other fibers, and it can be recreated, reused, uh, turned into clothing once again. It is less expensive to take clothing to the material level and reuse the textiles because the processing doesn't involve as much water, as much production, etc. So upcycling has begun. Also, solutions include that there are now uh, additional retail channels where products are sold and they are called pre-loved. They are consignment. They are luxury pre-owned. This is similar to the auto industry, which used to only sell used cars, and now they sell certified pre-owned vehicles. And so retailers uh, online like The Real Real or Poshmark and, and, and many, many others are selling return clothing as good as new. Even some of the major department stores around the world, in, in North America, we have Nordstrom, we have Macy's, we have uh, several others. And around the world, you've got many department stores who have learned to take the clothing and put it into an off-price area. Or Nordstrom has the Nordstrom Rack stores. Saks Fifth Avenue has the off-fifth stores. So brands are learning to cope with this in different ways. Some of the brands of like Nike, Adidas, uh, DKNY, uh, even Levi, they're learning to open up their own websites and sell return garments and return shoes and return apparel products on those sites of their own. In fact, Patagonia and North Face in Colombia, some of these premium brands are saying, and Nike is doing this, they're saying, send us your returns. We will give you a credit and allow you to buy something else on our site. And then they take those products and they make them as good as new, as much as they can. So there are some solutions in the apparel industry that are coming 
at the very high end of the apparel industry, there are serial number tags being added, RFID tags being added to help the retailer and the manufacturer track that when did I really sell this product and did I sell it at a legitimate retail store? Because what happens with returns, you saw them in those boxes, there may be Levi's in there, there may be DKNY, there could be all kinds of return brands and people buy them at a flea market or on eBay and I'll show you others. And, and those products get returned to the new retailers. People expect their money back. And so it's a very costly process to sell Louis Vuitton products or Burberry or DKNY uh, and very high-end products that are $1,000 or more. People return it to the retailer. It's been used somewhere and people want money for it. So there's, there's many, many challenges in the apparel industry and in the entire uh, e-commerce industry. So the next five years, we're going to see e-commerce grow. We said maybe it's 20% now and the returns are going up. Imagine when e-commerce becomes 30% overall and returns are much higher on e-commerce. So the returns industry is growing. And I and I appreciate Chelsea and e-commerce letting me be the last one because nobody thinks about reverse logistics. No one wants to think about the returns. It is usually the last thing they think about. But it's becoming a bigger, bigger problem because retailers are being forced to address hassle-free returns. And by the way, the, in the United States, we have a very large marketplace, but in Europe and in Asia, where e-commerce companies are selling across the border, many of you may know getting it back from across the border has its own challenges when there's the value-add taxes and the delivery costs and so on. So the manufacturers also are trying to limit their liability. Some manufacturers who make clothing, they simply provide an allowance amount, but they don't want anything back. But the allowance amounts generally, if they are 5% allowance rates or 10% allowance rates to not take anything back, the retailers are finding that those are not enough, those REITs. And at the end of the year, they come back to the manufacturer and they say, you gave us a 5% returns allowance, but you, you gave us product and we had 10% returns. So we need more from you. Regulations around the world are becoming more onerous because we're trying to avoid putting everything in a landfill. And as I'll mention in the next slide or two, electronics are, are e-waste is growing tremendously. So regulations are coming. Europe is looking at regulations to reduce the amount of plastic production because their landfills are filling up. And you will see some of that happening in Asia over the next few uh, years as well. Expenses, of course, are growing during this pandemic. The supply chain is broken and it's requiring more time, more cost. But the good news, consumers' desire for the secondary market is growing. People are happy especially young people, millennials, they're happy to buy a, a pair of Nikes, uh, Nike Air Jordans, instead of $200 for new, they pay $100 for a, a return pair, a pair that looks as good as new. And then again, the retail stores are shifting to the omni-channel presence. What else will happen in the next few years? Just a quick rundown. You will see more outlet stores, we call them. More stores like the big lot stores. Uh, there's, a, there's over 1,500 of those in North America. The dirt cheap stores. So there's a number of, of that. There's growth in trade in and trade up programs. Uh, Best Buy is a, a North America version where you can take your old electronics or cell phones, et cetera. And of course, the Verizons and the ATTs and Vodafones of the world are all offering that as well. Trade in, trade up. Uh, there's a lot more refurbished product. I'm sorry, the picture might be a bit small, but uh, a Home Depot, uh, the, uh, the, the home goods stores are taking those uh, products, the power tools, they refurbish them and they recondition them and they resell them online. There's also growth in offshore opportunities. I'm sorry to say that North America is especially guilty of taking those returns and selling them around the world, which can be also disruptive to a brand such as a Philips, 
such as a Louis Vuitton. If the returns in North America are shipped around the world, it devalues the brand. So there is growth in offshore opportunities, but it also has a risk. There's a lot of capital being put into the reverse space. Companies are buying companies and, and merging and consolidating and a lot of that. And an expansion of green initiatives. Uh, governments are giving companies money to find ways to take things back as opposed to going to landfill, as I mentioned. There's a dangerous trend of this product stays with the consumer versus the return because many companies are saying, you know what, if it's not a very expensive product, it will cost us more money to take it back than to tell the customer, keep it, we'll give you a credit and you can donate it, you can do anything you want with it. And I've had that experience myself with a, a set of uh, little steps for our dog to jump onto the bed up going up the stairs and it's a heavy piece of wood and it's sold for $50. And the retail, the e-commerce retailer said, just keep it because it's not worth it to them to get it back broken if they can only get two or $3 for it. So this trend of product stays with the consumer versus a return is a factor becoming bigger in Europe and probably Asia, again, because across the border adds all kinds of complexity. You can also see there's other ways that people are glad to keep these products because they can turn around and sell it on eBay. Some of them sell it, set up a shop on Amazon, and some of them will set up a business on Alibaba to sell goods. So that, that's, kind of, that's considered social sharing. Even Facebook offers a marketplace where you can sell things to people in your neighborhood. So it's uh, it's a lot of other things coming. The trends are are big. They're they're growing. But at the end of the day, we have to recognize there is an impact to the planet, and that's why we are very proud to say that reverse logistics is the cornerstone of the circular economy because the sustainability efforts that we are talking about and trying to see <clears throat> they help the planet while they foster the brand affinity. Brands like Nike are getting a lot of credit for doing this activity of taking things back. So the people believe in their brand because they say, oh, they do good things for the planet. Some of it's true, some of it's questionable, but consumers are very much socially conscious of the impact. They're hearing more and more about uh, products that leak into the water systems and so on. <clears throat> so that's why, as I said, there's government legislation in process everywhere in the world particularly in Europe, they tend to lead, and they have for many, many years with the uh, WE initiatives, the Rojas uh, programs, and so on. And again, we believe that that secondary market is so important as part of the circular economy. We will run out of stuff someday, probably not in my lifetime, not maybe not in anyone's lifetime here, but our children's children may see running out of of materials to build things and to make things. Here's one example. The annual e-waste is growing tremendously. That's 75 million metric tons by the year 2020, uh, 2030. We are already on the way there. And these electronics, we estimate that 83% of them simply go to waste. They're not being reused, even though there's metals in them, there's precious metals in them that can be reused, that could be harvested. But we are over 50 million metric tons. And this is just e-waste. I'm not talking about what apparel ends up in landfill and shoes and other household goods, appliances, but it's it's seven it's it's over 50 million metric tons and predicted to grow. This is what reverse logistics is about. We have to do more than just take it back. We have to now become circular and do something else with it. And with that, I will pause for questions. I have a little more information if people would like it. Um, but Chelsea, uh, I think you asked me to do about 30 minutes. I, I think I've covered about 30 minutes if we have some uh. questions. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, there are a few questions, Mr. Uh, Tony. I'll just bring it to the stage. You can answer it one by one. Okay. 
What changes do you anticipate in the coming years in the logistics and warehousing sector in the context of gender inclusivity? I'm not sure I completely understand all of that question. I do know that in the coming years, because I do participate in logistics events and warehousing events around the world, uh, I know that we are running out of space on the warehousing side because of returns, and we are not delivering fast enough because of the supply chain nightmares. So I do see, for example, uh, my son is in that industry. He is an over-the-road truck driver, and so there's an expansion in the need for truck drivers. For example, uh, younger drivers are now being accepted for for trucking uh, issues because there's so much demand. Uh, there's certainly, if, if we're talking about gender inclusivity, uh, there's not very many women in the transportation industry. And they need to understand, I, I'm proud to say, you don't need a college education to be in transportation. You just need to be a really good driver. And it makes it pays very good money now because of the huge demand. So I would encourage if, if gender inclusivity relates to uh, expansion of more and more individuals being included in this, transportation is a phenomenal area of, of growth and opportunity to make very good money as my son does uh, being an, a, a long haul truck driver. So I hope Ramesh that helps answer your question a little bit, uh, or maybe uh, ask it another way. As the logistics industry takes responsibility for the environment and gives priority to green logistics, well, that's what the circular economy is all about. We have to recognize that instead of making things, building things, selling things, and throwing things away, which is the linear economy, the circular says we have to make things, sell things, use, find a way to get them back at the end of their life and turn them into something else. That's what upcycling is about, and that's what the e-waste initiatives are about. I will tell you that Apple uh, and other cell phone manufacturers have admitted that they can get more gold out of a ton of cell phones, a metric ton of cell phones produces more gold and cheaper than to get gold out of a ton of dirt in the ground. So that's an interesting statement by Apple and others. And Apple has also said in the next few years, they want to make all of their new phones from the old phones. So they want to do the circular economy. So they're trying to drive all of their old phones back into their warehouses, their production facilities to do that. So I recognize that as a, a green logistics priority as well. We have to take things back and do something else with them. So Ramesh, again, I hope that answers your question, that question a bit. Oh, like this one, Ranga Sawami from uh, uh, Recommerce Bangalore, um, head of sales. Yes, the, uh, sharing more insights on your experience in resolving customer issues and your goal towards ensuring supply chain visibility. I, I, I cannot say it and stress it enough. Set expectations that you can meet or beat. That is a major uh, uh, component of the success of Amazon. When they promised two-day delivery, that was dramatic 15 years ago, 10 years ago. And that commitment meant that they had to drive their supply chain partners very hard, but they made that commitment work. A two-day delivery, 98% um, of the time or more. So you are setting your customers' expectations. We're going to deliver it in two days. And you do. And you send them text messages. You send them emails. You tell them the product's on the way. So you are setting expectations about delivery. And that is a that resolves customer issues because they know what to expect. I can also give the experience of, of the Best Buy stores uh, when I ordered a, a larger screen television set. 
They told me the day, uh, and this is the nightmare. We make jokes about the cable industry and, and service industries where people tell you, well, we'll either see, we'll see you one, uh, you know, next Tuesday. Well, what time next Tuesday? I, I have to work. Uh, we can't tell you a time, but maybe you can tell me morning, afternoon. So the service industry got a little bit better. But imagine when Best Buy set up the delivery and said, not only will it be next Tuesday, but we are sure it will be between 9 and 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. And then that morning, they sent me another text confirming the delivery. And then the driver sent me a text message, we are on the way to your house. And then the driver sent another text message and said, we are 10 minutes away. That is supply chain visibility for you as a customer. And did I have to call up and complain to anyone? No, because they kept me informed. So setting expectations and then exceeding those expectations dramatically reduces returns. The same thing applies to the package that you get. And when you get a package, and if it's a electronics item or clothing item, whatever, isn't it nice to open up the package and, set, and get a nice message? In the case of electronics, the challenge is uh, how to make it work. So I know that at Philips, we started a program. Uh, at first, we started a program with a stop sheet. You know, stop. Before you take this back to the retailer, call us for help. Well, that was a bad message. The red stop sign, it was not a good consumer, a customer experience. So we changed it to a gold star. We said, congratulations on your purchase of this wonderful Philips product. Here is how you can get up and running in five easy steps. We called it a quick start guide. And we used pictures and we used it simple numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and you're up and running. And so that meant dramatic shifting in how to take care of a customer. Because prior to that, Philips was trying to make global products and global packaging and global instructions. So we got a lot of things like even clock radios back because we were selling them in a box with multiple languages on it. And the instruction book was 12 pages in 12 different languages. And it wasn't good English or it wasn't good um, um, French or it wasn't good, uh, uh, it wasn't good Chinese. It, it was just not good languages. So that's another part of it, resolving your customer issue and reducing returns by setting expectations and then surprise them when they open the box or when they open the package and say, congratulations on your purchase or a gold star, thank you for your purchase. So these are simple marketing changes that can help reduce returns. And, and it's not always supply chain, right? But in the e-commerce industry, you can do the same thing. In fact, I'm a huge believer in the secondary market, my experience is I can buy a refurbished product for a lot less than new, and it generally has been upgraded, improved, the, the software upgrade, the firmware upgrade, the clothing's been repaired or inspected or, or shined like new. In the case of Nike, they make their things look very special. So there's a lot of insight. And, and so I learned in a reverse logistics space, you don't just own the process of the product coming back. You need to be involved at the beginning when those expectations are being set. And you need to be involved in that secondary market where the goods are going to go. Thank you, Ranga. That's a good question. All right. Recommerce Expo, they are inviting everyone to be a part of that on February 9th, 10th, and 11th. Uh, I know that I will be in uh, Las Vegas uh, in the United States. We will be doing the Reverse Logistics Association Conference and Expo. I wish global travel was a little more open these days, but I do expect by next June, the Reverse Logistics Association will have a conference in Europe. And we are targeting next September to come back to Singapore. Uh, now, 
oh, what do you suggest investors who are eyeing on the Indian market? There is a tremendous marketplace there. Uh, you are the world's largest democratic uh, country uh, with a 1.2 billion. I think that re e-commerce has tremendous opportunities. I think that re-commerce is a bigger opportunity because we know all of these returns are happening. They need to go someplace. So the best companies are the ones who are organizing end-to-end -end solutions. They will go to an example of, of, uh, of Amazon, of course, and say, we'll take your returns, all of them, and we'll pick them up and we'll take them, we'll process them, and we will resell them ourselves into their own secondary market. And of course, that's even happening on Amazon and uh, uh, other e-commerce. They're selling their own returns, uh, warehouse deals, et cetera. But investors who are eyeing the Indian market should recognize that there's not a strong secondary market yet, and that's an opportunity. These returns have to go somewhere as opposed to landfills. It's an opportunity. Now, it does cost money. It does cost money, but when you start it up and get it going, the opportunity is tremendous because you're able to buy the returns at a very low, low price, process them, find that most of them are as good as new, and resell them for a discount. So there's an investment opportunity there, uh, and that contributes to the green uh, economy, the circular economy. And I, I strongly suggest investors look at that secondary marketplace and find ways to make it happen. And, and again, it, it doesn't have to be a retail storefront. It can be on eBay to start. It could be on all the other local opportunities to start. And eventually it can become a store. So thank you for the question, Vengat. That was a slide I wanted to show. Um, if you want to back up a moment, I I have provided this slide so that all of you can do the math. If you have a company with sales of one billion and the returns rate is ten percent, you have one hundred million dollars worth of returns. If you can reduce that returns rate by only twenty percent to an eight percent rate you will have 20 million less returns. And if your company has a gross margin of 20%, you've now brought $4 million in incremental profit to your company. So any company that says they can't afford to do something here, this is the numbers. These are numbers that we did. Actually, we did more than that at Phillips, but we did grow that number and we do. we did bring profit to the company. We also improved the customer service and we increase the customer loyalty. So my last words to you, of course, is to say, if your company doesn't think you can afford it, you can, you do the math. And this is what makes you a hero at your company when you can do this. At Philips, we were a $2 billion company. Our returns rate was 12%. I got it down to 4%. So I generated tremendous profit for the company and they kept me around till I was close to retirement. And they said, thank you very much. There's no more returns <laughs> to worry about. I make jokes about working myself out of a job, and I did. But when I ended at Phillips, my career, uh, they were nice enough to hire me back as a consultant and then also uh, joined the Reverse Logistics Association when I took over. So uh, so there, there are so many ways you can be a hero at a retailer or a manufacturer. And the third party service providers who have solutions can also help you do that. So thank you for showing that slide. Were there any other questions? Who really owns the reverse logistics operation? A great question, Ramesh. Is it the right person or group to achieve the best results for the company? Um, around the world, Nobody wants to own reverse logistics. Nobody. Why? Because it's the dark side. You are always a cost to the company because you're letting people return things. I started out and, and I attended events where I saw many, many, many 
reverse logistics people as only part of the supply chain. And again, as I said, if you're only part of the supply chain, all you're doing is moving the returns and you're never going to win. There should be in every company a senior director who owns reverse logistics. In fact, there's maybe a handful of companies that actually have a vice president of reverse logistics. But the thing is, when I started in the position, because I came out of sales and marketing, they attached me to the sales organization. So when people said, you cannot go to Walmart and tell them to stop returning things, I said, yes, I can. I can go to Costco and I can show them pictures of the returns that they send us that are broken, that are garbage, and say, you need to pay us back for these things because I came out of sales and marketing. So I was part of sales, then I was operations, then I was part of credit, then I was part of supply chain, then I was part of service. It doesn't matter where that person is if they have the title and the responsibility and the power to make changes. Another example of the power that we had, we, dis, we developed a process at the company that says the out-of-box experience has to be right. So we would assign new products before they were introduced and shipped, before the first new product was ever sent out. We made a senior board member take it home and use it and report back. I took it home. It was a good experience. I could use it. That sounds very simple, but if the product didn't work right for one of our own team, it wasn't going to work right for many consumers. So we forced that one through because I had a title of senior director of returns management. So people paid attention. I was in the marketing meetings. I was in the advertising meetings. I was in the production meetings. I was in every meeting in the room. I was in the service meetings and I was in the supply chain meetings. So this area covers all bases. So who really owns it should be at the highest level possible what department you put it in is irrelevant because you cross over every department in the organization. Great question, Ramesh. Thank you very much. Again, that slide is in your deck, and I want to make sure you get the deck. Uh, Ranga again, Swami, uh, any words of advice you'd like to offer to young logistics and supply chain enthusiasts who are reading this? Yes. Pay attention to the circular economy. That is the new buzzword. We are past sustainability. We are now into how can my company be more circular? And young people bring a different perspective because you're willing to use things that have been sold as new. You're willing to take them. You're willing to look at, you know, five years ago, cell phones were in boxes that were the size of a computer. Now they're in a box that's just barely the size of the phone itself. So that came from people saying, why do we need the big boxes? So young and young people, uh, logistics supply chain uh, folks, you need to look at it from that side backwards. Because here's the picture. When you ship forward, the smaller the box and, and the better it looks and so on, the better it's going to sell at retail. But when it goes out looking nice and new, it will never come back that way as a return. And so it's very important to look at new ways of how do we move those returns. We have not figured it out yet. And we look towards new young people in the industry, in the supply chain to say, well, the ceiling fan was in a nice square box when it went out, but now it's coming back and the blades are sticking out. How do we move that stuff better, more efficiently? Because you sell and ship a pallet of new goods all the same model on one pallet. But when it comes back, you saw the picture of those pallets. How do we move those pallets of, of Gaylord boxes with multiple products in it and process it efficiently? We have not figured it out yet. So young logistics supply chain enthusiasts, please work on it. We need your help. And thank you very much.
Well, I, I don't mind continuing the questions, uh, Chelsea. I'll keep uh, addressing them as long as you put them up there. Does the company even have training programs in place for reverse logistics operations? No. <laughs> it's unfortunate to say that most companies don't. We are the training program right now for reverse logistics operations. Our website has white papers, reports, videos you can watch, people speaking about what they've done to uh, to help do better things in reverse logistics. So uh, our website, again, it's free, rla.org, www, of course, uh, the rla.org website. We have webinars every month. Uh, last month, we talked about fraudulent returns. Two months ago, we talked about apparel returns, what you can do there. Next month, we will be talking about the automotive sector. Auto parts and accessories are the highest return rates that are out there. So the training programs don't exist. Also, the global supply chain organizations, there's ASCM and there's CSCMP. They do a lot of education on the forward side. Unfortunately, they offer nothing on the reverse side. I hope to tell you that by the next time I'm invited to speak again, that there is a certificate program of education. Uh, and we intend to, every time somebody listens to one of our webinars, our committee meetings, uh, attends an event, that there's credits given. We are taking the last five years of articles in our magazine, compiling them into a textbook that will be made available. And then there will be accreditation tests uh, certificates to recognize reverse logistics professionals. So we're getting there. Thank you, Ramesh. Very good question. Today, we are the training ground. Look to our website for help. Any more questions? Participants can post it or uh, we can wind up the session. Chelsea, there's been some very good questions from your attendees, and I very much appreciate it, everyone. Thank you. Very good questions. And I appreciate the uh, participation and everyone paying uh, good attention. And again, Chelsea, please make sure this presentation is available for all of your guests and your registrants. Uh, sure, Mr. Tony. Uh, I think we, there are no more questions from the participant side. Okay, well, then Chelsea, I guess we are finished for today. Yes, Mr. Tony, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your valuable time. I know it's like uh, early morning there in your place, but you spared okay. this time and you uh, shared the valuable I knowledge for us. I hope uh, I the participants really enjoyed it and it was an interactive session as well. Uh, thank you so much, Tony. Looking forward to associate with our future events as well. Um, someone just asked for my LinkedIn link if you would give me a moment i will put it in there for everyone is that okay yeah, sure sure mr tony no problem okay let's get to my page and i found my link i will tell you that as long as you have uh, my name uh uh spelled correctly i don't think there's more than uh five people in the world with my name uh tony Shirota. So um, as long as you have the spelling, then uh, uh, you will be in good shape. Did that come through, Chelsea? Yes. Actually. The LinkedIn? Yeah. Just a sec. I'll also try it from my end. Oh, no. I'm sorry. That's, it's not there yet. That, that Now it should be there. Yep. We can see again. it, Mr. Tony. Yeah, fine. Thank you, Mr. Tony. Thank you so much. All right. And you all have a very good evening, uh, the afternoon, evening. And I will wake up with coffee and, and <laughs> go to my office soon. Uh, it, it was early, but it's been a pleasure doing this with you, Chelsea, and with the ReCommerce team. And I appreciate that you're trying to share this message with the uh, many, many uh, colleagues in, in Asia, in India in particular. Thank you so much, everyone.
thank you mr tony and i like to thank all the participants as well this will be the final session and we are closing here i hope to meet you all in our upcoming events we have shared our uh, linkedin pages and uh, contact details if you need uh, if you have any queries you can contact our colleagues whom you are in touch with they'll be guiding you to uh, register for our future events and uh, we do like to hear from you like uh, a feedback about our event so i request uh, all the participants to write to us like a uh, right to us the feedback about uh, international reverse logistics online conference so thank you all see you again thank you mr tony thank you bye now everyone